Hello Insiders, welcome to this new episode of the EU Bubble Insider. Today, our guest is Chris Ruff, Director of Communications and Political Outreach at Digital Europe. Chris, pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you for having me, Krzysztof. And thank you for uh, pronouncing my name uh, correctly, I which tried. is a rare, which <laughs> is a rare uh, thing. Uh, so, so I really appreciate it, um, Chris. Uh, you've had uh, I, I looked at uh, your your LinkedIn um, before our interview. Uh, I browsed far, far down uh, to to discover uh, what has led you to to your uh, position uh, at Digital Europe today, and you had. Quite an impressive journey, uh, starting um, as a language assistant in the British Council to uh, a current role um, leading uh, the communications activities of one of the biggest um, and most impactful. Um, I think it's it's uh, um, okay to say um, organizations, uh, uh, industry organizations in Brussels. Could you share uh, with us what has uh, actually started your interest in policy communications and how you navigated your career path to where you are today? Sure, sure. Um, well, it's funny you should mention the language assistant job. I mean, this was an Erasmus job, uh, but and, and you would think it's nothing to do, what I do with what I do now, but actually this was the thing that triggered it, right? It was the first time that I went and worked abroad. Full stop. And that was the primary motivation for the first few years of my career. Find a way, not because I don't like the UK, but because I, I found that sense of adventure and, uh, yeah, exoticism, let's call it that, uh, from working abroad. So I, w I went to France. I worked various things, not only as a language assistant, but as, as a waiter. And then I found that I had this golden ticket, right, which uh, a lot of people in, uh, well, you find a lot of people working in communications. Uh, they 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 have native English, right? And this is something I had, and it's certainly been a huge help throughout the career. And I have the utmost respect for everyone working in communications in Brussels that that uh, have English as a second language, because it certainly makes things a lot easier. And and I found myself working in communications, and I I, I really like the thrill as well of uh, that kind of um, urgency when something happens. Uh, I never had the the commitment that uh, many of the journalist friends that I have had, uh, you know, that they have. Um, but this is a way that I can get a little snippet of that by working in policy communications, by reacting quickly to what's going on, always being on the uh, related to the on the button issues. And um, yeah, from 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 there, I worked in the European Commission and uh, yeah, being a British citizen. Unfortunately, that so that story had to end at one point. And uh, Cecilia, the, the Director General of Digital Europe, she threw me a life raft to the private sector. And I've been here for three and a half years now, and I, I really enjoy my work. And what is it that, I mean, you partly already said that uh, you love the dynamism of, of, of the job. Oh. What is it that you uh, actually uh, like about working in, in, in comms around policy and politics? Well, I'm a bit, I'm, I am a news junkie, and the good thing about being a news junkie and working in communications is, is there's a direct link between your your habit, your your hobby, and your work. It helps you. The fact that you know what's going on, that you can link topics together, that you can see what I want to say is digital Europe and what's going on in the world and what maybe the people we want to influence are thinking and what they're thinking about. Um, connecting the two is is something which is yeah which is really fascinating for me and i i appreciate the uh the the, the linking of something i do i would be doing anyway right i would be reading the, the news and and uh, talking about it with friends with uh, someone that will pay me to do it so um before we get into uh your your you know the the topics of your actual work um to someone uh, who would be starting their career uh, in policy communications, uh, particularly in the digital sector, uh, mm. to, to a younger you, uh, what would be your advice? Uh, how to get your career uh, started in this space? I think there are loads of great opportunities in Brussels, but I think you don't have to start here. 
And I think whenever I'm hiring someone, I like to see people that have got a different uh, range of experiences, right? Could be either at your university, you could have been involved in in the, the student paper or student radio like I was, or you could have done um, communications or, or you could be, you could have been working on the social media for your local restaurant. I don't know. Um, I like to have people uh, that have that have been out there in the world. They haven't just done the classic career move that this isn't their first job after seven years of studying, basically. Um, so I, 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 my advice would be if you want to do policy communications, doesn't mean you have to do you have to study communications for seven years and then come come to somewhere like digital Europe as your first job. Get out there, get some experience in other sectors, um, dealing with people because ultimately that's what we're doing, right? We're, everyone in Brussels, whether you're in communications or policy, ultimately you will not be good at your job if you cannot convince someone on the other side of the table or someone reading what you wrote uh, of your opinion. Uh, this is an experience that can be gained in all kinds of different places. So it's uh, similar to uh, journalism where sometimes the most interesting and successful journalists are the ones who didn't finish journalism uh, at university, but something else, science or, or uh, well, just some topic that makes them, uh, that makes them experts, right? In right. I mean, there's a specific. remarkable amount of successful people that did not succeed in the early stages, right? And there's something that I always try to, to keep in mind when I'm when I'm hiring someone. It's difficult because you do get a lot of people who went to fantastic universities and you should not discourage that, of course. But but yeah, life experience is, is, is important as well. So uh, today I would like mainly focus uh, on, on discussing the digital uh, shaping mm -hmm. of digital policy uh, in Europe, because obviously you're 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 an absolute insider. You're at the forefront uh of of what's happening right now could you give us uh, an overview of uh, the current uh, landscape of the key challenges and opportunities that eu lawmakers are facing and also things that are important from the perspective of digital europe mm -hmm. i think it's in this case it's useful and we're going through the same reflection process now because next year is the elections um, we're going to be talking about not just um, the issues on the table, we're going to be talking about what are going to be the issues in, in five years. And we did something similar back in 2019. And I think it was a very different landscape. Um, for one thing, digital was not at the top of the agenda like it is now. I think there was, a, there was unease about big tech. I think there was a, a sense of fear about lots of technology. Um, but it was really the von der Leyen Commission that put digital as the as the top of at the top of her agenda. You know, alongside the green transition, you have the digital transition, and uh, and on top of and that was pre-COVID. But then on top of COVID, you had this acceleration of of digital not just being something in uh, in a work environment or um, something I don't know abstract. It was in your house. You were using the technologies. You could not have functioned without it. And that brought a different um, kind of perspective on digital. And it was one of the things, one of Digital Europe's biggest successes at the time that uh, when we had this post-COVID uh, recovery package, the 750 billion as it was there, there was money reserved for green, but we managed to get money reserved for digital as well, saying if this is one of your big transitions, put the money where your mouth is, because this is where you know Europe needs to shape up in the future. And I think and we're not there yet, but we've managed to shift this conversation a little bit from the dangers uh, of technology uh, through to something as an enabler for our lives, you know, for to live our lives uh, either at work or to help solve some of the environmental challenges that we've got at other places. So the challenge we have now is that whereas digital was being discussed in a back room by nerds before, it's, it's across every policy area. And we could almost react to every single commission proposal, whether it's on social work, on, uh, I don't know, even um, there are big digital discussions going on within DG Echo. So uh, everything to do with humanitarian assistance, helping to, you know, uh, not just give aid, but to kind of develop the digital skills and, and uh, an entrepreneurial spirit of, of, of uh, less developed countries. 
So uh, and 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 you see uh, the digital is across everything, but it's also uh, it was also accompanied by a huge amount of regulation all in one go. Let's say compared to some other sectors, uh, it had not had this huge amount of regulation, and now that's definitely changed in the last five years, and it's it's been a, a, a huge amount one on top of the other for our members to deal with, and this is something that we are also dealing with as as an association. We've grown a lot because we have to deal with all these many, many files. And as I mentioned, you know, in the different areas that have a digital dimension. So um, with the digital transition has come, you know, increased uh, interest, scrutiny, a kind of shift in the narrative, but also a, a hell of a lot more regulation. And um, it remains to be seen now in the next five years, whether uh, all that regulation is, is gonna support Europe to be, let's say, a big digital player over the next uh, decade or so. Are we going to see more and more digital companies growing in Europe? Are we going to see uh, digital skills growing in our continent? That That's still a question mark, and that's something we're going to be discussing a lot up to the European elections. How does it help that um, the, the topics that you are uh, working on became mainstream? uh in in just a couple of years from being discussed like you said by nerds uh to being discussed almost by everyone i don't mean to, they... i don't mean to disparage nerds we have a lot of a lot of great nerds in digital europe as well i absolutely didn't mean that uh <laughs> because someone has to start the important discussions but yeah. now you know with especially uh everything that's going around ai mm -hmm. um being so relevant for the every for everyone uh, you can say yeah. from 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 workers to students to teachers in across industries um, so does that help in 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 uh, bringing your issues your 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 messages to to the attention of uh, uh, of lawmakers and stakeholders and if yes then how it certainly helps. I think to, the AI example is a good example because you had the AI Act, which I think was very interesting in Brussels for people in Brussels, and they knew that this, this was going to be a big piece of regulation. But still beyond that, and we speak to many small companies that's kind of aware that something's going on, but not, not really down in the details. But um, with you know ChatGPT bursting onto the scene, um, it puts it in people's hands now. People say, okay, this is AI. And of course, it's only just a small slice of AI. And that's that's maybe the negative side of it, that people associate now AI purely with this kind of generative AI, the stuff that's helping kids to cheat on their homework or whatever, or, or also helping lots of people in their daily lives or uh, making tasks easier. So certainly, if you're working on a topic that people understand and can kind of uh, grasp what it means to them, that's helpful as a communicator because, um, yeah, you, you, your your biggest task is to take the abstract and, and what the EU does is often very abstract and bring it down into something understandable. So the more that the technology itself is is kind of widely understood, the better. But yeah, the, the downside is, as I said, that um, AI has huge amount of applications, uh, not just for people, uh, using it in uh, like we just discussed, or ChatGPT, or other uh, Bard and others, but uh, across you know huge industries making uh, buildings which produce around forty percent of our uh, CO two emissions, making them more efficient. You know, uh, being integrated across big uh, polluting sectors. I think this connection is one that I'd like to make more, but it's still quite abstract. So AI to the green transition. Uh, that's that's something I'd love to to do more on, but it's still, uh, yeah, it's not quite in the same league yet as the discussions on on ChatGPT and generative AI. So uh, now that people have this proof of concept, what AI actually is, yeah, the first reaction is often this is going to take away a lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. How do you? What's your response to that? Well, I don't think you can deny that a lot of jobs will change. It's going to be majorly disruptive. Um, 
but it, it's not the first time that we've dealt with this kind of situation as as, as humans. Uh, not so long ago, you know, the advent of computers um, probably put a lot of typists out of business. A lot of people working in other kind of sectors related to the paper economy out of business or had to retrain. So this is not new, but it's we we you cannot deny that it's happening, right? When you have when you're faced with something like this. Uh, nobody can deny that a lot of jobs will change. I already see my job changing, or especially the jobs of, um, let's say, the interns who are joining Digital Europe, how their roles are changing. Uh, so I think people, uh, that, that maybe the one difference is because this is this is really going to affect uh, traditional, let's say, white collar jobs. Uh, people are a bit more scared because people like journalists and accountants and lawyers and communications directors, they're getting a bit nervous and they're maybe the ones that kind of dominate the conversation. But I don't think this is new itself. The fact that there's a new tool on the block and that humans have to adapt and some people will, will gain from it. And some people will have to completely rethink what they, what they do. Um, so is that, yeah, I mean, some people might say, well, let's blame the technology. Let's hold it back or block it in some way. Um, I don't think this is the right approach. Uh, I think there's, a, there's, there's ways of looking at it and making sure that it works for, for, for as many people as possible. But yeah, certainly it's, 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 it's not something you can stop right now. I, I know there was this open letter of many people saying, let's stop all the discussion on, on, on generative AI until we worked it out. So yeah, that that's, that's what I'd say my personal opinion is, of course. I always try to um, get the perspective of, of the guests of my podcast on one thing that is, I think you would agree, one of the most important skills uh, for someone working um, in the EU bubble, and that is the ability to explain complex regulatory issues in simple mm. words and i'm sure that um, uh, in in your work you sometimes have to face the challenge of communicating uh, benefits of, of of digital technologies to policymakers who may be mm. resistant or not uh, well understanding what this technology actually means what what is the context of this technology have you find have you found um ways to discuss quite complicated technological matters such as AI in a simple language, explaining it to to people who are not nerds? Mm. Um, it's difficult, uh, but I think policymakers, I mean, they, they're not unaware of, of all the issues that we talk about. And I, I don't think there's, I, I think, Often, unfortunately, a lot of new technology is seen through a lens in Europe, which is, um, okay, we have some of the biggest companies in the world, uh, and they're not from Europe. And these are the ones that kind of dominate the, at least in the press, especially, you know, we have, these are the ones that dominate the conversation. So that, and these are policymakers, especially in, in Brussels, where they have one superpower which is regulation and uh, but they don't have a huge amount of other things they can do if they need money you know that, that money needs to come from pots around europe so you have uh, a conversation dominated by this yeah this kind of few small large players um and you also have well i have a hammer that's my regulation that's my tool and then the problem looks like a nail for everything right so the, i don't blame any policymaker for 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 having for, for the amount of digital regulation that has come through what i would say is and you were alluding to this is the challenge is saying dig, the digital economy is so much bigger than that so much has so much more potential we we represent forty five thousand companies right um big ones small ones mostly European, but many coming from other countries as well. This is this is the this is how the digital economy looks. 
So getting that message across that digital is also, um, you know, making buildings more efficient. Digital is also uh, automated driving or digital is also, um, I don't know, the way that we are uh, looking at the war in Ukraine. Digital has also been a huge tool um, for the Ukrainians to kind of protect their country as well. Moving the data out at high speed to protect kind of personal information. And, and now there's a lot of talk around museums and cultural heritage. How can we use digital tools to make sure that we don't lose that, uh, even if the you know physical sites are being bombed? So, uh, and I think the war in Ukraine, for everything that's been terrible about it, has been an, a good example where you can say, well, this is also what digital is about. It's not just about four or five companies, uh, social media, et cetera. So I think that that is the big challenge and we, we continue to work at that every day. And I can imagine that also working with so many members of your organization, mm -hmm. you have to represent, although you represent one industry, uh, there is a wide range of business uh, specific interest and maybe potentially some 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 conflicts of those um, mm -hmm. how do you navigate this complexity um, in in from the point of view of communications and and policy work well thankfully a lot of the work is is not a lot of this work is not mine i mean my my the policy staff at digital europe do a heroic job uh, because on every issue there are differing views on some issues there are wildly differing views as you say at the end of that we always come out with something though uh, so whether it's a compromise or some people you know we we highlight some things more than others or we just you know decide not to speak so much about this one issue and focus on other issues this is how we deal with it and i think it's... as a com yeah communications team we have the easiest job we have the one audience the outside if you're a policy team you know you're dealing with the members you're dealing with this kind of um, conflict and you also have to keep an eye on the outside. So in some ways, I think that job is done for us before it gets to my table. From my experience, it gets really tricky when you have one company that is member of various organizations. Mm. For example, that company can have divisions. Uh, I will not name specific examples now, but uh, I think everyone knows uh, you know, the kind of big scale companies uh, we, we, we can think of who have different divisions uh, in different business areas even. And then uh, you can have uh, colliding conflicts of interest uh, between two organizations where they represent actually the same company. Uh, mm. So I, I, I've seen that happen uh, in the automotive mm. sector once. Uh, it's, um, it's tricky, but it's also fascinating from the professional sure. point of view. I mean, some companies have more resources than others. We deal with that as well. I think where you need what you need then is a very strong secretariat who who actively reaches out and listens to the voices of the people that can't be in every meeting or, you know, are trying to deal with 100 issues, uh, not just the one or two issues that they're specialized in. And that's that's something which we worked on a lot. And I think it's something we've been successful at Digital Europe as well. You've led some high-level political uh, outreach, Chris, um, including, for example, the uh, EU-US roundtable uh, between uh, Vice President Vestager and um, Secretary of Commerce uh, Raimondo. Could you share some insights from, from, from this uh, unique experience uh, and maybe tell us uh, how, how it, what, what, it, what you learned from it? Uh, how it influenced your approach to uh, to your work? Sure. I mean, I think that roundtable was, was, I mean, you could look at it in itself, but for me, it was the culmination of the work that gone before. So as you say, I'm responsible for communications, but I'm also responsible for the outreach side. And I see the communications is really uh, our shop window. And how do we, uh, how do we let our wider, the wider public know especially the target people we want to know, that Digital Europe are the people to go to on this specific issue. And once that work is done, then these these kind of 
these big round tables start to happen more and more. And I feel that's we've done a huge amount of work um, establishing Digital Europe as the leading voice on the on the EU US TTC. Uh, great policy work, but also you know our own events, uh, individual meetings, communicating about those. And then when it came to it, when when Vestager uh, and uh, Secretary Raimondo, they were looking for uh, someone who can pull together senior execs from both Europe and the US on digital issues. I mean, their teams, their, them or someone from their teams, they came to Digital Europe. And that that's for me was the success. Now, the meeting itself, I think these things are always worthwhile, but often you have everyone says their little bit for two minutes and then everyone goes home, some nice photos. And sometimes uh, that's why I mean it's it's only part of a bigger story. The the pre work and then afterwards, you know, generate after that that first connection is made with the the highest level. How do you then make sure that your messages are then uh, filtering through to everyone else that works in the administrations and that you make the most of that opportunity? So, yeah, uh, it it was a, it was a fantastic event to be a part of. Um, and uh, but for me, it's a part of a broader com communications and outreach strategy. But this is also true for for any other tool uh, or, or part of a communication strategy that whenever you have the opportunity to plan something long term to to, you know, just focus on a broader perspective of activities, you will get better and more solid results because mm. communicating something quickly uh in the short term perspective can be loud yes you can have uh, like you said you can have a picture that uh, will appear everywhere because it's a nice picture but there might be not much substantial impact other than just having reach and reach looks nice in um in uh, reports and summaries but doesn't always mean that uh, results were delivered. Mm. Um, it's only half the story in, in communications, of course. So the reach, making sure people see it, but making sure that then uh, the next step they take is to go and read the paper or to go and watch the, the longer form video or to find out more about Digital Europe. That That's the key. And and I, I think planning, you mentioned planning. I think we we have great planning across our issues, but occasionally something like this just, you know, uh, and, and often when it comes from the public sector, they say, okay, we want to organize something in two days. Uh, can you get uh, seven CEOs around a table or something? So you have to be ready to, to react quick because politics all, doesn't always lend itself to, to amazing uh, long-term planning. And I would say that we are slightly better at it often than government. Uh, so you have, to, you have to plan, but you have to react quick as well. I think uh, that we used the word digital already uh, more than enough in the in the conversation. There's uh, also one other uh, space of, of you know communication activity that uh, I wanted to ask you about, and that's uh, traditional media uh, because mm -hmm. this it's still a big uh, part of the of of the communication uh, of 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 a good communication mix um, if you know how to use it um, and uh, from the specific EU bubble Brussels perspective um, how do you see the role of traditional media versus social media um, in, in you know shaping the uh, opinion of stakeholders uh, on on the policy issues that uh, you are trying to uh, to present mm. I think they, they go hand in hand and it's something where uh, working with traditional media, you said you were a journalist before. I've never been a journalist. Uh, I've worked a, a lot with journalists and there are times when I think, you know, I get it. I totally get it. This is, that's, I, know, I understand what, what, a, what a story is. And there are times when I feel like I've got the best uh, story in the world and, and no one else seems to agree. Uh, what, what, I mean, we had some, a, uh, let's say a success in that regard recently. I'll give you one example uh, on the Data Act. Digital Europe has been very active uh, in, uh, I mean, throughout the process, but now as it enters the final stages of negotiations, um, we uh, we sent a letter, you know, so very traditional, 
but what we did uh, uh, i think what what made it so successful in the media uh it was you know featured across you know financial times political writers everywhere uh after that uh, the timing was right we elevated it to ceo level and um, the messages were good i mean we were saying the right things and it chimed with something out there uh, at the same time as being at the right time and i saw the impact after that you know we we saw engagement with our you know website with our social channels uh, hugely increase i think you break down to a whole new audience in media much wider that you cannot do with social media alone um i'm not a great believer in spending a lot of money on metrics like views and things on social media because i've seen videos that we've done that you know we put money behind it and we've got 30,000 views but you, you don't see that translated into signups at events signups for newsletters views on our papers and things like that whereas the traditional media did so i think it's still got that reach that social media cannot get yet at the same time when someone reads the name digital europe in the financial times or in political or wherever they take the time to look at your site you need to make sure that you've got an excellent shop window so that they don't just leave again right so you make sure they come they stay that they see um, other things that you've done that they and and that they uh, they come away thinking that digital europe is a, is a key player so that for me the two go go hand in hand and i think we're getting closer to that spot where we um where we where we're kind of we're getting a bit better at it now and it's and it's partly because we're not doing as many press releases as we used to, right? It's it's picking and choosing your moments. It's, you know, journalists are human too. They don't want to hear from the same people all the time. They want to vary up their sources a little bit, their their quotes. So make sure that you, when you reach out to the media, you've got something good to say at the right time. And also uh, one thing that I could add here is that in the recent years, we've seen many organizations uh, take on this approach of becoming publishers of content. Uh, and, and, and it's great if if you can have your own, um, you know, editorial approach to, uh, to communicating with your audience. Um, and when, when this was starting, I um, heard discussions that, well, maybe this means that at some point journalists or media will not be that important anymore. Mm. Uh, it's 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 actually the opposite. They are still important and relevant. This is just adding value to uh, to the communication. Um, yeah, I, I, I think you will agree that uh, this is just making adding another channel to to have a stronger uh, outreach rather than taking away the importance of of uh, analog traditional media. Definitely, and I, uh, I you need multiple channels. And you need to be making sure that they're working in harmony and that you have the right strategy to make sure that when they pick you up on one, they go and visit the other or, or, or vice versa. And to have uh, an efficient outreach, uh, you have to have tools that allow you to um, to work uh, more efficient, faster, to recycle content in, in a creative uh, um, way so that brings me to the question how uh, the digital europe team um starting with you is using uh ai and chat gpt and similar tools that uh, have uh, appeared uh, in the last uh, months because i would of 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 course expect that uh, the digital europe team uses uh, all the newest digital tools uh, that are sure. available how did it uh, change the way you work it was actually, it's funny you mentioned that because it's one of the first things that came in. When I came into the job, uh, we spoke to various people and I mentioned in interviews, uh, hiring for, for communications officers in my team. It's like, we are Digital Europe. People expect us to be good at digital. They will look at our members and say, well, you know, and, and if we're not, if our website looks shoddy, our social channels are not, you know, up with the latest trends, they're going to be doubly disappointed because they think, well, you know, these guys are supposed to be kind of evangelical about the digital world. Uh, and and I think that pressure may be feeling it a little bit on uh, from ChatGPT and other tools as well. I must say you had on a previous podcast, uh, Maria Lenkova, 
nice from the uh, from Sefik. She's really a kind of leader when it comes to this. Uh, she's someone that I follow on LinkedIn and and pick up where she you know where she leaves her her trail of of clues because she's she's really excellent and I know that she's doing a lot. There are tools that we uh, we're using it a lot in in Canva, uh, generating images, supporting generating power, you know slides for PowerPoint. This is something that we are. Uh, for, takes a lot of time. If we can remove that, that's excellent. At least with first drafts, you never take away that human edge. Again, summarizing long documents, um, always with a with a critical eye, but can save time. Uh, we're not at the stage where we are, you know, I wouldn't say we were using it to its full potential yet. Uh, but the, I noticed something uh, in our staff that it's it's not people like me that are using it the most. It's 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 the people who are kind of here for a year in their studies, our interns. For them, it's already useful, and it's already kind of saving time in a way that the, the rest of us can't notice. They're probably having more free time as a result of this because they're given tasks that would have taken two hours, and now they do it in fifteen minutes, and then they have time for to do something else. So. When it first came out, I remember talking to Maria and other communications directors. I was like, how? I think the, the people that are going to suffer might be interns themselves, because how did I know how to write a good tweet? It's because I wrote hundreds of bad tweets, or I wrote, you know, articles. You have to write, write, write. You have to practice to be good at that. Uh, and if those tools are taking away that kind of drafting process, then how do you as a human being learn to be someone that can kind of check the AI generated text at the end? But I'm shifting my opinion, having seen it on the ground now, because as I said, the, the, the people that are using it the quickest are are the youngest in the team. And, and therefore, I don't see any think they're going to have any problem. I think it's people like me, maybe you, I don't know, maybe, I don't know how much you're using it in your work, but uh, we are the ones that are maybe going to take longer to, 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 to shift to this new way of working. And I do think it is a watershed moment. We will look back on it as, as in the same way that, yeah, as I said, the advent of computers. Uh, so let's get on the bandwagon, but I'm slower than others. So maybe you're expecting Digital Europe to be at the forefront, but I'm, I'm pointing at others that are, are doing it better than me and I'm trying to, to catch up. So you asked how, how I use it. Uh, I, I definitely uh, love the the the. the the, the speed that, uh, for example, ChatGPT uh, can can give me answers to things that would have taken sometimes hours uh, to, to 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 research or to 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 summarize for for someone, that's great. One observation I have um, is that from from my perspective of a consultant who works with clients, that probably very soon, what is happening will lead to a situation where I will not have less work, but my work will be expected uh, faster, mm -hmm. uh, delivered almost immediately, which will, um, and probably also the expectations will come together with uh, expected lower costs of that work, because obviously mm -hmm. if something is delivered faster, then it should be cheaper. And yeah. that will in, in turn lead to the need to actually work more um, and probably also increase stress of, of people working in this uh, in this in this space where I am. So it's exciting. It's right now for for many people in the agency business is making uh, their lives easy. But I don't mm. think I think this is not what's coming uh, at us long term. So that's you think my... clients will clients will catch up soon and they'll be like, wow, OK. What I used to pay you for, you can do in half the time. So I'm going to pay you half as much. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I think this is a matter of months. I think there's a, um, yeah, and uh, there is a limit. Okay, so machines can be ever more productive, but human beings, it seems like we're getting to a point where there's a, um, there's a kind of limit to the amount of, inf I mean, people have always said this, so maybe I'm just a, a, a doomsayer, but uh, you do see that people are reaching their limit more and often, at least in, mentally. Uh, I'm sure, you know, burnout rates are up, mental health issues are growing. So 
is there a limit to the human? I, that's something I'd, I'd like to explore more is that machines can do more and more, but is there a limit to, to what we as humans can uh, can actually deal with in terms of productivity? And this is very much my position, nothing to do with digital. You know, this is my I think that thought. in many ways we will have to reinvent the role we have to something more creative, more strategic. Mm -hmm. um, because there are so many uh, use cases that I see that will, will just, of, of, for example, work that I used to uh, still charge uh, charge money for, which probably I suspect will, will not be the case uh, pretty soon. One example mm -hmm. um, that I think is interesting to mention is preparing uh, PDF documents. It's now, you know, it always has been, but now on LinkedIn you can see that you know everyone is publishing reports on on almost everything. It's 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 a great communication tool to publish mm -hmm. a, a paper as PDF, a report, uh, and obviously the design is important. Um, yeah. And now that this design has to be done by a human, a human has to design this in in either some Adobe programs or in Figma or in Canva or. Uh, whatever tool they they decide to use, uh, probably it's going to be a graphic designer. If you want a really nice looking report, I suspect looking at what's already available, that soon we mm. will have a tool where you will just either give the tool a previous document and just give the text and the document prepare something like this. Yeah. Or here you have some data, make an infographic out of it. Probably Canva will uh, will mm. will will be able to do it. It's already and, doing things like that. Yeah, yeah. And it's going to save think, weeks sometimes of, of work. I think that will go. I think that will happen soon. I don't think we're there yet. They they, they still need a professional eye. Uh, what I think will be one of the first to go is um, is uh, uh, images, you know, buying stock images. This is oh, something yeah. where where, you know, we spend a lot of money and you end up your the the lady that you had on your report, oh God, is you know your competitor's got the same lady on the front, is, and and people recognize them because you end up recycling the same ones, and now with with Canva or other tools you can, you can say I need you know for my digital finance report, I need an image which shows some maybe euros falling down and you know a kind of digital landscape behind and boom there it is, you use it, yeah, uh, no copyright to pay for uh there's a, there's some money saved so uh, and that's a huge industry that i feel or is gonna is gonna be uh well it's gonna lose out very quickly very very quickly. but they had some good years so they had some very good years <laughs> chris um and this brings me the word good uh years brings me to my last question um like I warned you, I, I I would like to finish our conversation with a more philosophical uh, question about uh, something that philosophers often discuss, which is the concept of good life. Um, mm -hmm. Now we are looking at a revolution that will not just change industries um, or or you know business, but it will change the probably the lives of of every European. Um, how do you think can all this digital transformation, these digital technologies contribute to achieving uh, a good life um, of, of Europeans? Where do you see the hope? Mm. Big question to end. Um, I mean, there's a lot of discussion on what the, the good life is. I can only speak from a personal experience that I find the fact that I live in a different country my son is here, his grandparents live in Spain and the UK. That connection that he can have with his grandparents, thanks to digital technologies, although it's not the same, it's not quite as good, uh, is something unique, right? And that contributes to my good life. The fact that I can work more flexibly, um, that contributes, you know, the fact that uh, we live in a cleaner city, in part thanks to digital technologies and and hopefully with the with the transformation of other sectors the energy grid and and, and others we will digital there will improve my quality of life 
um, it's this the the you need to as a person though I think you need to set up more kind of guardrails for yourself, right? I think that's that's the key, and that's not always easy for everybody. I struggle with it my, myself at times, um, but I think to go back to a previous point I made, it's not the first time humans have dealt with technological change. Uh, there are downsides, there are upsides. Uh, on the whole, we will manage, but it, maybe it will take time to find a, a, a more of an equilibrium. And and maybe we're not quite there yet in our current society. So I think what is what I hear from you is that the chance for a good life is in how we take as individuals take control over the technology that is available, and not how it takes control over our uh, existence. In part, uh, but it also requires, and then, you know, we're not anti-policy makers of digital. I mean, if you look at the Industrial Revolution, uh, thousands flocked to the cities. In part, life was, was awful for, for decades, you know, working all hours of the day, no health and safety. Uh, child labor. And child labor. And and what came in, you had weekends, you had health and safety regulation, all this kind of thing that came a few years later. Um, I think this is something, uh, you know, potentially maybe we need a three day weekend. Again, speaking as, as Chris Ruff, nothing to do with digital Europe here. But a lot of what we're discussing in our more. manifesto, uh, in our manifesto for 2030 is, so we're going to have a lot of issues in the future that are unrelated to digital technologies. So aging population, um, climate change and others how do we use the tools uh, to support that uh, and how do we make sure that we have the tools in europe and that we're making the tools in europe as well uh, so we need to kind of use them in the right way and also uh, we strongly believe that uh, europeans as well need to be the creators of technology um, and not just the users right so companies based in Europe uh, need to be uh, yeah need to be involved in that process uh, and that's something that I think uh, in the current debates around regulation or supporting industries the balance is not quite there right we see a lot of regulation all in one go uh, but what does that mean is that it just means that Europe becomes a less attractive place for digital companies and if we want those technologies to have digital uh, European values. That's also something we need to keep in mind that this needs to be uh, the place where they are created as well. Chris, thank you very much for all the interesting insights and and, and super inspiring thoughts. Uh, I enjoyed thank you very the much. a lot. Thank you for finding the time uh, to to speak with me. Thank you, everyone, for listening and uh, stay tuned for the next episode of the EU Bubble Insider. All the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gustav, for having me.